Have you had experiences where the primary focus of any particular visit with your healthcare provider or the healthcare provider of your baby is their weight? This can really cause unnecessary worry and anxiety for the whole family. And there are lots of ways to measure the health and growth of a person. And this includes babies. So today, let's talk about what I look for as an IBCLC and internationally board certified lactation consultant in an individual visit and ideally in a series of visits as I get to know your family and your baby and why one individual weighted feed doesn't give me everything I need to know about your baby's health. So let's get into it. When I began breastfeeding, I was blindsided by how difficult it was, having known only a handful of people who had ever done it and only seeing it up close a couple of times, I had a huge learning curve. Since then, I've become a doula, a childbirth educator, and an internationally board certified lactation consultant. I'm your host, Lo Nigrash, and I welcome you to the Milk Making Minutes, where we explore the systemic medical and cultural barriers that make feeding our babies so difficult, so that you know your baby feeding struggles were not your fault, and your triumphs really are the miracles you feel they are. Over the past series of weeks, I have had a couple of situations with clients where I did a weighted feed and the transfer was less than what I expected to see based on what I saw during the breastfeeding. So by that, I mean client latches the baby, client reports that The breastfeeding session feels really good because I try to make it a habit to never tell somebody that they, that the latch looks good, but rather talk to them about what I'm noticing about the latch, about a wide open mouth, about lips phalanged, about hearing gulps, and then say, how does this feel to you? And so for the most part, all of that is good. Baby feeds for a good amount of time. They look relaxed at the breast. They have a good tummy to tummy positioning. Their feet are settled. I'm hearing a good suck, breathe, swallow pattern, which is really important. We can see milk after the feed. And afterwards, baby looks satiated. And then we go to do the post feed weight and I'm surprised by how little baby has taken in after the feeding. But I don't show my surprise because I'm there as a professional, I'm there as a supporter and I am there to help guide this family on what they should be doing to support their baby's growth and development when it comes to breastfeeding. When I go to set up a weighted feed, I always give a reminder to my clients that this is one data point. It is one point in time. And that just because I am way, I am getting the amount of of milk transferred at the breast right now at this particular feed, it does not mean that is what your baby is taking in at every feeding in a 24 hour period, or it is what your baby took in at every feeding yesterday. And it is what your baby is going to be taking in at every feeding tomorrow. It just means it is what your baby took in at this feed today at this individual time. And I'm going to mark it in the chart and we know what your baby took now. Because breastfeeding is dynamic as opposed to bottle feeding, particularly formula feeding, which is static. It doesn't change. We know how much is in there. We feed that amount. And we can be very sure of the amount that the baby takes in. Now, we can't account for what baby might spit up afterwards, of course, 
but we can know for sure what baby takes in. But breastfeeding changes and it changes based on stomach size and it changes based on storage capacity of the parent. And we're going to be talking about that today. And so I had a particular situation with some clients this week where this happened. It was a lower than expected milk transfer. I actually only did the weighted feed on one side because baby got super cozy after the second side. And I just didn't want to torture either the baby or the parents after the feeding. And I knew I'd be back. And I had said, don't worry, I'm not worried about this. And then When I came home and I was going through my chart notes and I was getting ready to reach out to the family with the notes, I reached out to a fellow IBCLC. Her name is Erin Tangway. She's a good friend of mine and she was actually featured on episode 25 of the Milk Making Minute. So I'll have that in the show notes of this episode and I'll have her website featured there as well. She's a really great lactation consultant who also leads study groups for people who would like some help with studying for the board exam to be an IBCLC. She's the one who helped me study. And I just wanted to touch base with her about weighted feeds and what she does in particular cases. And I gave her more details than I am going to give on a public podcast about this case. And she helped ground me as I help ground my clients in the data. And so what do we know about this? We know that most of our feeding recommendations in the United States that we hear, or most of our expectations culturally are based on bottle feeding norms. But bottle feeding norms are very different than what we know is biologically normal for breastfeeding babies. So bottle feeding norms are based on feeding a certain number of milliliters or ounces on a schedule. And that number of ounces increases and increases month after month to increase the number of calories that the baby needs. We also know that bottle-fed babies, on average, consume more milk per feed and feed fewer times per day. And some studies suggest that an overfeeding pattern then gets established early in life, increasing the risk of childhood obesity. And I am not knocking bottle feeding because there are ways to mitigate this, including using paste bottle feeding, which I have an episode about, which I will link in the show notes. Last night as a family, we had the rare opportunity to just have one child at home. We had not eaten dinner yet and it was getting pretty late, but we asked him, it's just the three of us. What would you like to do? And my son said he wanted to take a walk at a nearby reservoir. And neither my husband and I were stressed out about this because we had a refrigerator full of feast and fettle, which had delivered home cooked meals right to our front door that we knew when we came home from our walk, all we would have to do was just heat and serve it. So off we went on our walk right around sunset around the reservoir. It was beautiful. Just the three of us and our dog. And then we came home and within 15 minutes, we had the most delicious coconut crusted cod and roasted cauliflower. And we ate it while we played Uno together and the cleanup was so easy and it made our evening so amazing after a full day of work and allowed us to connect with our child. And this is why I am so happy that Feast and Fettle is a partner of the podcast because I truly believe that anything that allows families to spend more time together and less time worrying about all the things they need to do like getting dinner on the table is something I can get behind. So if you would like to see what Feast and Fettle can do for your family, go to feastandfettle.com and use my code M-I-L-K to get $30 off your first week's order. 
and let somebody else do the cooking for you and just go take that walk. But we know that on average, formula-fed babies consume much more milk per feed and per day compared with nursing babies. 15% more milk at three months, 23% more at six months, and 20% more at nine months, and 18% more at 12 months. And this is from a study by Heinig, Nomsen, Pearson, Lonardal, and Dewey. Part of this is because the mechanism of creating milk in the mammary glands and then transferring milk is quite different than that of mixing up milk in a bottle and feeding it. And babies are controlling the intake at the breast when we have breastfeeding rhythms instead of breastfeeding schedules. So here are some basic reminders about milk production and baby stomach size. The body knows to make colostrum when the placenta is delivered. That's when that hormonal signaling occurs to begin releasing. The colostrum has already been created and that's the body's signal to begin releasing that colostrum for the baby. The volume on the first day, total volume is one ounce because the baby's stomach is tiny. And researchers tried to see if they could stretch baby's stomachs on that first day using a sort of balloon mechanism, and they were unable to. Baby stomachs could not stretch. So if babies get overfed on that first day, it just comes out in the form of spit up, So one ounce total, that's why we're feeding tiny volumes. And that's why getting just little drops on day one, day two is plenty for that baby. And then that volume increases to about 10 to 19 ounces for the daily total by day seven. And by this time, the baby's stomach is expanding and can comfortably hold about one to two ounces. By the second to third week, milk production builds as long as there is continued and frequent feeding. So if there is not continued and frequent milk removal, then this might not occur and we will see a down regulation in milk supply. And By about the second to third week, it is possible to see that babies can consume about two to three ounces per feeding, and they're taking totals of about 20 to 25 ounces in a day. And then by about the fourth to fifth week, babies take about three to four ounces in a feeding, which is a total of 25 to 35 ounces. And this is about as much breast milk as a nursing baby will ever need. It never gets more than that. Now, these are based on averages. And as I am constantly saying on this podcast, and as I am constantly reminding my clients, your baby and the babies of your clients, if you are a practitioner, your baby is not an average. Because this is based on the size of your baby's stomach and their particular appetite. So some babies who are teeny tiny might take lower volumes than this. And some babies who have larger stomachs might take larger volumes than this. It's Also, the amount that a baby might take in any particular feeding is based on their stomach size, their ability to transfer milk, but it's also based on the storage capacity of the mammary gland of the feeding parent. Storage capacity refers to the maximum volume of milk available to the baby when the mammary gland is at its fullest time of the day. 
And it's actually not related to the size of the breast. Some people have large breasts, but they have a smaller storage capacity. And some people have small breasts, but they have a larger storage capacity. Because breast size is really related to how much fatty tissue is in the breast. Whereas storage capacity is related to the number and size of the milk ducts that are in the mammary tissue. And so these are two totally different concepts. And so you cannot look at your breast size and determine how much your storage capacity will be. But what you can do is follow your baby's hunger signals. Because if your baby is wanting to feed very frequently, it might be that your storage capacity is a little bit smaller. And so they are only able to take in a couple of ounces at a time because that's what your breasts are offering. If your baby tends to space out their feedings by the time they're five, six weeks old, it might be that you have a larger storage capacity and your baby has a bigger stomach and is able to handle that much milk. And so then they are able to take in larger quantities of milk. Now, we also know that milk transfer can vary throughout a day. Within one day and from one feed to another feed, milk transfer can vary dramatically. So we know that morning milk is more abundant and we know that evening milk is less abundant, which is why babies tend to want to nurse more frequently. Prolactin is more readily available in the late night so that by the time the parent wakes up, their milk is more abundant in the morning, which means that by the evening, there are lower prolactin levels, which means there is less milk and the baby often wants to nurse more frequently because they're getting smaller quantities of milk at each feeding. We also know that milk fat content is usually higher in the evening, which is supposed to help satiate the baby for longer periods of time, but it doesn't always seem to work out that way. So the other thing to remember about storage capacity, and I have a whole episode explaining this, it's my sleep episode, and I will link it, is that humans are carry mammals. And our mammary glands are not designed with large storage capacities in general compared to other mammals. So mammals that leave their babies for long periods of time and go off and find food and then come back, they have much larger storage capacities and their babies take in larger quantities of milk. But because we have lower storage capacities in general, frequent feeds are expected. And so if we don't deliver on those frequent feeds, then our milk supply will decrease over time. So I hope, so there's a little bit about expectations and why I don't just rely on a one individual weighted feed. And instead I look at the bigger picture and I say, does baby have plenty of peas and poops? Do they look settled when they are at the breast? Can I see them suck, suck, suck and hear them swallow? Do I see milk in the mouth when they are done nursing? And do I see milk accumulate at the nipple or under the nipple shield if they are using a nipple shield? There are all sorts of ways to know that baby is healthy and satisfied without relying solely on one individual weighted feed. If you are looking for a lactation consultant who can help ease your mind about your nursing difficulties and questions, I would love to be the person that does that for you. Reach out to me. My website is www.coabinbirthservices.com. Let's work together to help you feel more confident in feeding your baby in whatever ways that you would like. I'm here for it. Talk to you soon. And don't forget that you can go to feastandfettle.com and use my code MELT to get $30 off your first week's order. 
so that you can focus on spending time with your family, enjoying these summer months and not worry so much about what to put on the table. It's really been great for my family to have delicious food delivered right to our front door and still get to spend these long evenings together. So enjoy that service or provide it for a friend who has a baby. Bye.